So this was designed for being given in front of a thousand people, <laughs> and it was this morning, but um, but we're gonna we're gonna do it three. And so feel free to just treat it as a talk and shout questions, and we can we can go off the rails. That'll be fun. I already gave the talk uh, once, so um, so I'm happy if you want if there's something you wanna wanna go into. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just start, and uh, and we'll see if um, if another person or two shows up. But um, yeah, so the idea here is to, um, is to look at the significance of this particular place um, in, uh, like in, of Oslo in the, in the history of, of programming languages. And um, so I'm, a, I'm wondering if you've heard about Krista Nugor? Yeah. So, so the joke uh, is that uh, Krista Nugor is a Danish uh, football player who um, was very famous in the 70s. Um, that's probably not who you're thinking of, though. You're thinking of this guy who is... Um, uh, together with Ulio Handal, um, who, in, who designed the similar languages, which um, the, the general purpose one was, is considered the first object-oriented programming language ever, and, um, and, was, and came out 50 years ago this year, so in February of 68. So it's like, um, it was like what later turned out to be a magnificent turning point in the history of programming languages. And of course, uh, I don't, uh, are you both Norwegian? Okay, I'll do it in English anyway. Well, you are too, I know. Uh, so I'll do it in English anyway because otherwise um, I'll, I'll stumble. But um, yeah, you, you can understand what's on the screen there. Uh, so, so one of the things that, uh, that Kristen said, so um, I got a chance to hang out with him a number of times when he was alive. And, and uh, he would often say, he would often quip that if he had a penny for every uh, object that was ever instantiated, you know, if he could just have, every time somebody said new object, he could have gotten a penny in on his account. He would be a rich man. I think that's probably true. Um, so uh, this is sort of like the general outline of um, of the languages that he worked on. There, um, there is similar one which was for. So how much? Do any of you know any of this stuff already? No, no, some of it. Some of it. Yeah, yeah, I think they still teach it in Norway. It's the only place in the world where people still learn this stuff. Yeah, I'm uh, lecture introduction course. Okay. Uh, you, you get uh, you, you, they they herd you all into the Simula Auditorium at the university, and uh, <laughs> and they tell you why it's called that. Okay, yeah, I've been there. Um, so uh, you know, they started out. Uh, he wasn't really a computer scientist to begin with. He was into operational analysis, and so he got this idea that hey, maybe you could use computers, um, and he had some ideas for how to do it. But he he wasn't like. Um, a programmer. He didn't have the skills to, to do this himself, so he teamed up with Ole Johan, who was rumored to be one of the sharpest knives in the, in the Oslo drawer at the time. And, and they, uh, they went and did first a domain-specific language just for simulating, for what they call discrete event simulation, for essentially playing out um, different things behaving according to rules over time and seeing what happens. Right? The simulation. And, uh, and that was what was called Simula 1. It was based on, on the uh, programming language Algol at the time. But then after a while, they realized, wow, these are actually great concepts for generalizing and using for other aspects of programming. And that's, uh, together with some things that happen, we'll, we'll see that, that happen in, uh, in programming languages elsewhere, that gave them the um, sort of the, uh, the bits and pieces to, to make it a general purpose programming language, which became Simul 67. Then um, uh, Kristen also got very involved with the trade unions and, um, and got very, he was very into um, enabling the workers uh, and giving them a, a seat at the table and those kinds of things that you know, um, back in the back in the early 70s, you know, we were we we were all about empowering people and and um, and um, not just letting the big corporations uh, uh, exploit the workers and so on. He was very much into that. I think he was he was um, a member of the Workers Party all his life and very involved with the trade unions. And one of the things, so he, he, was, he was able to kind of combine these interests, like his, his personal ideology with, uh, with the language thing, because he realized that the way that you wrote programs in, in Simula was actually kind of much closer to how people think about things and, and not just, and, and further away from just how computers happen to work inside, which is sort of very much a geeky thing. And so he, um, so he together with a few other people, they actually took the concepts and, and designed a language a complete language that couldn't be run on computers that was all about describing things uh, in a precise manner. Uh, and that, that was what became Delta. 
which is a pun on, on uh, both the Greek letter delta, but also the word for participate in, in Norwegian. Um, so this was really the start of participatory design, what became object-oriented design, object-oriented analysis, all those fields that had their own uh, separate life ever since with, uh, you, you've maybe seen some of these design tools that have UML graphs and all that kind of stuff, uh, rational rows, all that. That all, he didn't, I don't think he liked the graphic stuff very much. He, was, he, he felt words were better, better but that all kind of came from, from uh, his early work on, uh, on participatory design as well. So, so that was another field that he founded, and he founded it with a language. But then he went and got new friends. He became a professor in, in Aarhus in Denmark and uh, had lots of students flock to him. He was like a very charismatic figure. And um, some of the best students sought him out. And, um, and they started a project together, which eventually, he was in Aarhus um, in 1975, 76, and it took them a lot of time and a lot of red wine to, to uh, finally come up with a programming language or finish the programming language. And um, um, uh, uh, I'm told that they were pretty exasperated with him because he was in no hurry. He did not, uh, they, they had to meet deadlines and, and submit PhDs and feed their kids. And, uh, you know, uh, and uh, he was just like, he was happy to sit around for days discussing all the concepts and making sure that we were, we were viewing the big enough picture and all that. Um, so. Did any of you meet him, by the way? No. Um, so anyway, um, eventually a programming language came out, which was sort of a, an attempt to uh, make a smaller, more general, unified uh, successor to, to Simula. Uh, it was his idea that this was the language to take over from Simula. Of course, it never really succeeded in doing that. So, so the quick uh, genealogy of programming languages here, um, uh, Algol was sort of like the, it was, Algol in, uh, at that time was like Java in the 90s, in the late 90s. It was like the language that everybody, that, that, that drove all the thinking, um, except it was better. <laughs> it, it was a beautiful language for its time that, that really introduced the ideas of high-level programming languages and structured programming and those things. So a lot of things derived from Algol, um, strong typing as well. Um, and Simula 1 was a, uh, was a superset of that. They added features to Algol rather than create their own language from scratch. Um, there was a lot of, there's this language that never actually happened in a way, um, an unofficial version of Algol that was proposed for, to be the next version of Algol that was made by two guys. Uh, one of them was, um, and th these guys uh, later became extremely famous uh, on their own. Uh, one was Tony Hoare, who, um, invented uh, all kinds of things, quicksort and um, axiomatic uh, uh, semantics. And um, um, uh, one particular thing that he invented at, in, at this point was um, record types, reference, referenced record types, where you had records that are, you know, types that have a, a number of fields inside with different types, like structs and C. And the fact that you could reference, or you would reference them indirectly, with, there would be a pointer inside, right? And you would dereference, you pass them around through the pointer instead of copying the values around. It's amazing that somebody had to invent that, but, uh, but that, was, that was where that came out. That was an Algol W. w. Uh, he wrote it together with Niklaus Wirth, um, it was a Swiss guy. Um, and uh, they proposed it for the to the Algol committee, and they said, nah, that's not a big enough advance. And, the, uh, and they went on to uh, create a, a complicated, useless beast of a version of Algol 68 that nobody thought was a good idea and said no to these things, which of course turned out to pretty much change the world of programming, even though the language itself never made it. Uh, Viet just said, well, screw Algol, I'll go and make my own language. And, uh, and he then went and made Pascal, which, which essentially eviscerated Algol from the world. Like it took over from Algol. It became the next Algol. So there, you know, serves you right. Um, and, uh, but, but these records that with the references, that was just a thing that Kristen and, and Ole Johandal, uh, that they needed to, uh, to generalize the concepts of Simula 1 and make it a general purpose programming language. So that idea, along with the, it's, there was sort of a hidden snake in paradise here, which was the fact that um, just for expediency reasons, Tony Hoare has talked about this since as his billion dollar mistake. He said, oh, um, let's also invent a null pointer. Let's make it so that the default value of these references is, uh, is null. And, um, you know, how bad can it be? And it was easy to implement. And um, 
And uh, if you think about how many null reference exceptions have been thrown since then, if, if he had to pay a penny for every null reference exception, yeah, he would probably be a couple of billion dollars in the short. Um, so, um, so he calls it his billion dollar mistake. And that, of course, was also adopted into not just similar, but every up you're going to language, language since has had this problem, this snake in paradise. Okay. So um, let's actually look at some similar. Uh, I don't know, did any of you look at similar before? No, they, they don't actually make you read it in, in no way anymore. That's good because it's a little, by, by modern standards, it's a little heavy to look at. It's, it's worse than Visual Basic, I want to say. <laughs> and that, you know, Visual Basic is very wordy. So, um, so, I, so I came up with this dialect of simula that I call simula uh, for the purposes of this talk that is just sort of like a curly brace version of the language with the same semantics and same constructs. Um, I didn't actually like come up with the whole language, but I just I just fudged something for the slides. Um, I don't have a compiler or anything. Um, but uh, is essentially here first to show that all of the concepts of object going to programming, all the central concepts were there. It wasn't. It was like f came out fully formed. It wasn't that you know languages introduced these ideas one by one over time. Similarly, when it came on the stage, it had all. It had this whole new thing all there. So it was. It was like a big, big turn of events. And you know, they had. They had classes. That was a new concept. Um, they had classes had uh, virtual methods. So there's an abstract uh, procedure here that uh, in, a, in a class glyph. Classes couldn't be abstract. That's something that came later. Um, so if you created a glyph and you call print on it, you just get an exception. But that's like a small thing that, that um, was easy for languages to add later. Um, and then you could make uh, subclasses, right? You could derive from, uh, from the glyph. They put, it on, they put the, the base class in front of the class keyword. And for that reason, they call this prefixing. That they never talk about subclassing or inheritance wasn't even a word back then that was used for this. Uh, they just called it prefixing. All the all the concepts and all the words we know now came later. Um, it's just the features were there, right? So, so you could prefix another class, and that means you get all the things that are in that in that prefix class along with the new stuff. So yes, we can make two uh, derived classes, two subclasses, um, and then we can go and um, have, have some reference variables, a single reference variable, and an array, um, create new ones that has a new uh, keyword, um, and uh, assign them into variables, um, and then call, you know, uh, uh, once you've built up a little structure of them, then call the virtual print method with the dot, which is also like a new thing at this time. I, I don't know that they invented the dot, but um, it was right around this time that people started using the dot, which is like, the only thing that almost all object-oriented programming languages have in common, even, you know, across widely different syntaxes for everything else, they all have the dot, except Smalltalk. Smalltalk doesn't. But um, it's become this universal thing across all languages somehow, yeah. again from here. So, so just to show that you could write an object-oriented program back then just as well as you can today in, in C Sharp or any other modern object-oriented programming language. So that was pretty amazing, and a, a big, big, um, uh, a big, big um, contribution to to languages. But you could also do things in Simula that didn't catch on and that didn't move into the mainstream, um, that are quite interesting, um, and um, and some of them it's a bit of a shame that they went away. Some maybe not so much. But one of the uh, one of the things that Simula inherited from Algol was. Algol has completely general block structure. You can just nest things uh, inside other things, right? But the only things you have in Algol are procedures, right? So you can nest procedures within other procedures within other procedures, like you, like you can with functions in JavaScript or with local functions in C-sharp or many functional languages also have that general block structure, but for functions. But Simula had it also for classes, right? So you can have classes within classes within classes and within procedures and, you know, you can mix and match. And it's like proper nesting where the thing inside can see the instance of the thing around it that it's part of. So they had this general block structure and they use it um, quite a bit for program composition. So there's an example of it here. They, uh, when they went to Simula 67, they still wanted to do simu simulation, but instead of having the concepts of simulation hard-coded into the language as domain-specific domain constructs, they had now, uh, the world's first application framework uh, called class simulation. And so here is, uh, 
here's a tiny bit of class simulation. Um, it's a class, um, and it has another class inside of it that's called process. It has several other classes inside of it that are the things that you use for simulation. Okay, so process is one. Process is the class that represents something that is an individually active um, object in a simulation. Okay, call that a process. Um, what you, and that's also a class, but what you notice is that this class here, the process class, has code inside. It doesn't just have uh, members. It also has some statements. It doesn't matter what they are. Um, it's just that they have some statements that are stuff that all processes do. Because objects don't just have things, they also do things in Simula. Which is quite different from, from what we got, we've gotten used to since then. And because it's a base class for other things, it says the thing, it has the things in it that all things should start, all processes should start out doing and should end, end up doing at the end. And then it has the special keyword inner, which says, whatever code you put in, in the uh, derived class should just go here. Right? When you derive from this, the, the code that the derived class adds gets executed at this point where the inner occurs. So that was a mechanism for, for inheriting across classes. Uh, inheriting code across classes. Um, and you can see that the outer class um, simulation also has code down here. Um, I abbreviated it, but it, it, it also, and it also has an inner. So when you want to go and simulate something, um, like I'm doing here, I can prefix not just, you, you can't just prefix classes, but you can also prefix statements and say, in, in, essentially, this, this piece of program inherits from the class simulation in the sense that all that is in there now, be, now gets in scope of my program. So I'm now inserting myself into the scope of the program, and my code goes into the inner of that class. Right, so, so the whole simulation sets up the way simulations, the simulation framework works. Then I get to write my main program here, the dot, 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 starts things up, where I'll probably start out some of my, um, some of the process specializations that I've made, like the worker here, which inherits from process and, um, and does some things, okay? So we have active objects here for the first time, and we have this notion of inheritance, um, uh, for code as well that, that come up here. And that never really made it into other programming languages, except for beta, <laughs> which Kristen was in charge of. Um, so I thought I'd show you that as well. So some of the things made it and some of the things didn't. Um, but um, uh, all the things that, well, the major things that came to constitute object-oriented programming in the, uh, in the next 50 years and, and probably way into the future um, uh, were, were there. Okay. So that's Similar? Cool. Any questions? Um, just yeah? In our C sharp has the inner nesting now, right? Inner class nesting. Um, yes and no. Um, it, it doesn't really, uh, let me move up again here. It doesn't really, in the same sense, you can nest classes in C sharp and you can in C as well. But that's just a scoping mechanism. That means that you can't, you have to dot in to get at the class. You can't. Get, see it from outside. But in Simula it has a deeper meaning where if a class is nested within another class, that means that it is nested inside of instances of the class. So the, so the process class here is a different process class for uh, one instance of the simulation framework than for another instance of the simulation framework in that it can see the actual instance variables of the enclosing object. In, in C sharp, you can't you can't see the instance members of the enclosing class when you are when you're nested. So it's an important difference. It's more like the way that lambdas can see enclosing local variables in a, in a method in a, in many object-oriented programming languages today, or in functional languages too. So it's it's sort of proper what, what some some of us old people will call a, a proper block structure. Right? Um, it's not just about scoping. It's really about um, being situated within the, the enclosing instances. So, uh, good question. Um, so, um, so that was Simula. If we go and look at what that led to, uh, Simula was fairly popular programming language in industry, but not like broadly, wildly successful. Um, I think that its, its lasting legacy is in what other languages uh, learned from it. Um, 
So there are two in particular that were sort of the second generation object-oriented programming languages. One is Smalltalk, which took some of the concepts from Simula and completely redid them in a, in a very, very different kind of context. Um, Smalltalk was very inspired by Lisp, which is a, a, a not strongly typed, a, a completely dynamic language. It's also completely reflex, uh, reflexive. It can change itself and code is data and there's no clear separation between uh, compile time and runtime in, in, uh, in Lisp. And Smalltalk took all this, combined it with the emerging uh, graphical user interfaces and uh, produced something that is a programming language uh, that doesn't actually even have a full syntax. Instead, it is this interactive app almost, is this environment that you go into with Windows and um, with, your, with the mouse that they just invented at Xerox and, and click around and they, the, all the programming constructs, the classes, um, are themselves objects running and as you program, you create new classes and put them into data structures that you can then view in these, uh, these system browsers, these browsers where you click around, I want to look in that class, I want to see its methods, and it's all you click through lists, and only when you get down to the body of the particular implementation of a method in a particular class do you actually have source code. It's a very, very different world. And, and Smalltalk notably has no notion of block structure. It's all, it's all up in the top layer. In fact, um, in many ways, a small, a small talk program is, is complete spaghetti because uh, the whole global world is a flat namespace and, um, and also the, the, there are no control structures in, in small talk. The only control structure in small talk in, in proper small talk, they cheated a little in some of the implementations, is virtual method calls. Right? It's, that's the only thing you have. You don't have if, you don't have while, you don't have anything other than virtual calls. And then you have blocks which are sort of like lambdas. And so the way that you do an if statement, there's an example here, is that you take a Boolean, uh, and then in Boolean expression, and then it has a method called if true, if false. Then method names are in, in parts in between the arguments. And then you pass it a block for what it should do if the, if the object is true, and a block for what it should do if it's, call, if it's false. So you can then, so there's a true object in there that implements the if true, if false by calling the, the true argument. And there's a false object that implements the same one by calling the false argument. And that's how, that's how control structures are even, um, uh, even made to happen. So it's very, it's very consistent and radical and beautiful and self-consistent in its own way, but it's very, very different from, um, from uh, the similar uh, worldview. Um, there were some other people at uh, Aarhus University when Kristen was there. Um, this is actually my dad, and he has nothing to do with this talk other than he had uh, Kristen Nygaard for his uh, advisor at, um, at his final project, and I uh, just wanted to put him in there. Um, this is another guy who was around at the same time, though, and uh, more people know. Uh, it's, not a, it's not as good of a picture, though. This is Bjarne Struestrup, who, um, who came up with C++. And C++ was really directly inspired, not just by Simula, but by Kristen. When Kristen was there, Bjarne got to know him. Um, Bjarne uh, told me how uh, when he was a thesis student, he, they had little offices and the guest apartments for guest lecturers were just up the stairs uh, at the top floor of the, of the department and Kristen was there and he always got bored so he would come down the stairs looking for something to do and Bjarne's office would be the first one he would pass. So Bjarne made sure to always have a crate of beer in there so he could lure Kristen to come in and share a beer and, uh, and talk about programming languages. And um, so he was very personally inspired by these ideas in object-oriented programming. But he, but he saw correctly, I think, a lot of people have been deriding C++ for like, not being pure and beautiful enough and making too many compromises. But he saw correctly that uh, it was very hard to implement these ideas in an efficient enough manner that there would be uh, broad adoption of object-oriented programming. So he wanted to, um, he added it to C, which had the philosophy of kind of no cost abstractions, like no overhead abstractions, and tried to expand that notion as, as much as was possible to object-oriented programming. And that was really the key idea of, of C++. And I have to say, uh, wildly, wildly successful, right? Because you got an object-oriented programming language that was actually competitive. Today, it's competitive with almost any other programming language on the planet in terms of performance. Um, now, 
it's been around for a long time and it has many like aspects that are getting a little long in the tooth, uh, but, um, but it had an amazing impact and really, really contributed to the success that opting oriented programming had. So, so between them, the, um, the C++ and Smalltalk opting oriented programming languages, they were the ones that made opting oriented programming popular and made it last for 50 years. Um, so uh, we need to give them credit for that, even though, of course, Kristen and Yol Johanna are the real heroes in the story and all that. So. Um, but a lot of things were lost, too. A lot of these ideas that Simula had were lost in that process, including the block structure and the active objects and the, um, and the inheritance of, of, uh, of code. Now, um, I mentioned that um, Kristen went on to do Delta, which was a language that was for describing things, describing systems. And at an even higher level than computers, it couldn't describe things that you can't, couldn't even put in a computer program. And that was sort of a part of a, a realization that they had stumbled onto some really powerful ways of describing things. And, um, and he famously quibbed um, the, a sort of a, um, a reference to the conceptual modeling that they, that they were realizing that they were coming up with, that you know, one word can say more than a thousand pictures, which is, which is the other way from how you usually say it, right? Uh, one picture can say more than a thousand words, but he turned it on his head because when you're talking about abstract concepts like animal, for instance, which is one I'm alluding to here, you know, it's really hard to draw a picture of animal. What would you draw? <laughs> uh, right? You, have, you need a thousand pictures to get the concept across, um, whereas the word in and of itself has that whole like um, expressive power. So, so concepts in the language are a very powerful thing and, and basing your programming language around those it's a very strong, effective thing to do. So they were very focused on modeling. And as, as he did uh, Delta and as, as they worked on Beta, they kept like honing this um, conceptual framework, if you will, for the language and, and um, d putting a lot of work into describing in excruciating detail exactly what it was you did when you were programmed. To program is to understand. It's another phrase that came from that. So there are kind of two layers of this. One is that at the layer of when the program runs, the program execution, the, um, um, you know, you're trying to model something in the real world, or maybe it's imagined, but you're trying to model something, something else. And, the, and you do that in the computer program, but when you do it, you don't model it every which way. It's, a, it's what they call a physical model. And what that means is that it's, it's one to one. It, you can see the, the things, the phenomena in the real world correspond one-to-one -one with things in the model, in particular with little allocated chunks of memory uh, you know, that are the objects. Every object represents something that it's modeling. And that's as opposed to how most programming languages were, where maybe you had all the names in one array and you had all the, all the ages in another array. Like the, the shape of the, of the program as it was running did not correspond to the shape of the world that it was trying to describe. Whereas that was sort of the thing that object-oriented programming led to. It's physical modeling. It's one-to-one. -one. And it's isomorphic in a sense, right? You can think of it that way. But also at the, so that's sort of the running program. But at the, at the program text level, um, uh, you sort of uh, have a similar thing where um, if you look at the way that people think about, and we're getting to these concepts, like the concepts that people have in their mind, at least so... Um, Kristen and others would claim, and it's a fairly, uh, it's a reasonable model for how people think about things, is that they have concepts in their head, they use nouns for them, and some concepts are more special than others, um, like sheep is more special than animal, um, and you know, um, sheep is more special, there are fewer sheep in the world than there are animals, but on the other hand, the sheep have more things together, or more things in common, they have, there are more properties of sheep that are shared among all sheep then there are properties that are shared among all animals, right? So this is like, as you get more special, you have more shared properties, but fewer uh, phenomena that, that fit into the, into the concept. And that maps exactly to classes in, in uh, object-oriented programming languages, where you have that specialization when you create subclasses or when you prefix, like they said in similar, um, and you add more properties and more members as you specialize. So that... And that correspondence has been really, uh, as, even though it was never as clearly expressed around other, program, other object-oriented programming languages, that has been a driving factor, I think, in how, why they became so popular. 
Um, it's a lot easier to to conceive and maintain a system when you um, when you have this mental model for its structure that corresponds to the domain that you're programming for. And it's a lot easier to involve and get, you get participation from the end users when the concepts of the program correspond to the concepts of their domain. So, um, so it's very powerful. Um, again, one-to-one -one at, uh, at the concept level there. So um, given that, armed with that uh, realization and lots of red wine, um, Kristen and his Danish, uh, his young Danish friends, um, they embarked on, on beta and eventually in, it's hard to say exactly when the first beta version was, it, it kept evolving, but around 83, I want to say it was pretty much finished. Um, they created the programming language to end all programming languages. Um, and um, w so it tried to really be very true to, this, to these uh, uh, modeling ideas, but there was also uh, well, actually, let's let's take a side trip for a moment just to consider what what's with all these um, Greek letters. Actually, there are, there was delta and now there's beta. Well, at some point during the red wine infu infused discussions, they came up with this idea that there were four layers of programming language, uh, four layers of languages that were interesting. They already had delta, which was a description language. That was the highest level for people only. And then they had high level programming languages that you would r want to write programs in. But then you needed implementation languages that w where you sort of had to m manually translate to a low level program that would run better on a machine by being implemented in assembly language, which was the lowest level. So uh, by happy uh, coincidence, that mapped just to the sequence of, uh, of Greek letters, starting with the delta they already had and down to the alpha at the bottom. However, so, this, so the grant plan was to design all of these languages one by one. But of course, uh, the, the lower ones they never got to. And the, the name beta came to be used for the, for the higher level programming language. It turned out they didn't need the lower ones. So that was the origin of those uh, Greek letters. But one central observation that one thing you noticed in, in Simula maybe was that um, this thing with it, classes and procedures are very similar and similar. <laughs> Uh, they, uh, the, the, the thing that classes can also have code inside and, and, um, and so on. There, there are many ways in which classes look more like procedures and similar than they ended up doing in these other second generation programming languages where they became more different. They sort of like, they cleaned it up and separated the two concepts properly. That's how they thought of it, right? But for beta, they kind of, they thought about it the, uh, the opposite way. They had originally conceived of objects, I think Kristen said it this way, objects are activation records that survive. They're like the activation records are like the stack frames, right? Except they're not necessarily in the stack of a procedure uh, while it's running. Like in one particular instance is running, that's the activation record. It looks like an object, right? It has some fields, which are the local variables, the state of the, of the procedure. And essentially they thought of objects as those guys, but they survive the initial invocation, right? They stick around and other people can refer to them. And, they, and for beta, they thought, well, isn't it odd that we have these things that look so much like each other in the language? Shouldn't we try to, you know, unify? Shouldn't we try to see if we can take these two concepts and smush them together and come up with one programming language abstraction, a single abstraction language, where, where we just view procedures and classes as two different sides of the same coin, of the same uh, 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 construct. So, so that's what they did, and that's what we're going to have a look at now. So they came up with this concept called a pattern. And pattern is the unification of classes and procedures. So I have some beta here, and then again, you know, I have a C-like syntax that I call CETA um, on the right-hand side that might make it easier to read, because the beta syntax is really odd, and we'll get into why, it, uh, part of why it's so odd uh, in a minute. But um, um, the idea is, so now you can see I have declarations like before, and the things I'm declaring, they look like they're classes, like a text stack sounds like a class, a link sounds like a class. And again, we have the block structure, the, the nested class here. Um, but we don't say class, because this is, these are pattern declarations. We use the same syntax for declaring classes and for declaring procedures. Um, it's the same construct. So here comes a, a non-virtual uh, method we would, we would think of it today of the, um, of the text stack, but it's really just another pattern. It also has some things. You see, it has exactly the same declaration of an element inside as the link pattern has. They're, they both have some state inside. But then this also has some other parts than the declarations. Uh, 
uh, namely a, a, um, a body of code that it can execute, and it also has some uh, a, a declaration of what comes out. Um, and, it, and you can see I tried to map those to uh, the return keyword over here, because that's sort of more familiar for, for, for C-like syntax. And if we try to look at a method that takes things in, similar to the push method here, another pattern has some state, and it has a do part, which is what it does, but it doesn't have an exit because it doesn't return anything, but it has an enter, it has parameters, essentially, that come in. So all patterns can have all or any of these parts. It can, they can have declarations, they can have uh, enter parts, which are things that come in, they can have a body, this is the code that runs, uh, when you execute them, and then an exit part, which is what comes out when you're done executing. And um, now you can go and build objects or methods or m weird mixtures, if you want, out of those uh, to your heart's content. There's no limitation there. So that's sort of the big unification. But once you've done that, you have to start wondering, well, there were all these things in Simula that you could only do for classes or only do for procedures. Now, I guess we're going to have to allow them for both since they're in the same, they're now the same thing. So what happens when you start allowing these things across? For instance, we had virtual procedures. Um, uh, let me, oh, hang on. Let me, um, before we get there, just let me, yeah, one of the things was parameters and, and results. Um, I'll get to the virtual procedures in a moment. We have parameters and results and procedures. Um, we sort of had parameters for the constructors for classes as well, but we didn't have results for when you were done evaluating a class in Simla. But a class-like pattern can totally have, uh, have parameters and results. You would use the enter part for, in, for constructing or initializing it, and the exit part is sort of, you can use it for getting the value, evaluating it, and, and figuring out what's it made of. And for instance, if you want to compare two objects for equality, you don't just want to see if it's the same object, but if they're, if they're equal, then you would just evaluate the, the objects and get their return value out, and you compare the return values. So it was used for that kind of thing. Now, uh, to the virtual uh, elements, um, well, so here we're using it. Creating a text stack, creating a text, putting the text in there, and getting it out again. No surprises there. They're a little hung up on the references. They have very explicit syntax for reference because objects can also be evaluated. So you need to explicitly take a reference to the object when you don't want to evaluate it. You just want a, a pointer, essentially. And that gets a little tedious. So I just, I just elided that over here. And instead, when you want to evaluate an object, I put the parenthesis on the end like you're calling it. That's probably more familiar today. Um, so, but it's a text stack. What if I wanted a stack of... Um, a generic stack, a stack of anything. Can you somehow do generics in, in, in beta? Well, yes, you can, because you can, um, and this comes to the thing about what, what's this class, what's the thing with classes that corresponds to virtual methods? Well, that should be virtual classes. What is a virtual class? Well, it's a class declaration inside of another class that can be overridden in derived classes. And so here, for instance, I am declaring a class, a virtual class called type, which is the type of thing that this stack is supposed to hold. And then if I want to create a, a stack of a particular type, then I prefix, I derive from, I make a subclass of the, of, oh, um, I should have just said stack here, um, that's a typo, um, of stack. And, um, and I, I uh, overwrite the, the class here, and now I have a stack of texts, because all the places, because now in, inside of this particular stack, um, uh, every, everywhere it says type in the code, that now means text, just like a generic parameter, a type parameter, right? And, but, I, but instead of passing it in through a parameter list, I pass it in by specializing. You use inheritance a lot more. Um, so that's one way that, that's one kind of crossover concept. That almost ne didn't catch on anywhere, except actually in Scala. They have this notion of abstract type, which um, is exactly this. They, this is probably the only really useful concept from beta that survived into another, I wouldn't say Scala is mainstream, but at least another language that's alive and well. Um, it got uh, the, the abstract uh, types, um, which are virtual, essentially virtual classes from beta. And I actually think it's a wonderful concept, and I would love to have them in C-sharp one day. Um, so, um, other things, um, you can, as you saw also in, no, actually, not as you saw in, um, similar to what you saw in Simula, um, 
you can also create um, procedure patterns that can be specialized, that you can derive from. So you can have a base pattern that is a procedure. Um, so this is a for each um, that will enumerate all the elements uh, in, the, in the data structure and, and invoke some code for each of them. Um, today, you would probably, in other languages, you would do that by passing in a lambda for the code to invoke. But not here. What you do instead is you leave an inner in the for each, and then people can go and create uh, a sub procedure of, by deriving from for each, putting code into the inner, like their code goes into the inner, and, um, and now when you, when you run that one, as the loop goes around, your code gets executed every time. Right? So, so um, you don't need to necessarily look at the details, but it's just a loop that has a little, you know, it has, um, uh, it keeps track of how far you are down the, the, the list. It puts an element type, in, an element in scope that the inner can use, and it also has a bool that you can set to true if you want to end, if you want to terminate the loop. Okay, so if inner assigns true to, to end, then the next time around the while loop uh, quits. So let's look at a use of that. Here's a very simple uh, use of for each. I'm creating another method inside of stack. That's the count method that tells you how many elements are in here. It derives from for each. It gets all this code and it adds another member in there, which is the size that we're counting into the accumulator. And then it runs this code every time around. So it, count, it, it ups the counter and then it adds a return which, um, which is the, the size as it, as it is at the end, right? So, so it's very, you don't really need lambdas in a, in a language like this. You, can do, you, you, you specialize instead of passing um, lambdas or, or higher order parameters. Um, another uh, example is a contains method that checks whether a given object is contained in here. Well, how do we know when an object is the same, that may depend on what element type we have. How should they be compared? So we can put a virtual method on the stack class that is a, vir a virtual pattern um, that, uh, that does the, the comparison. Um, and then when you create your own stack class and you override the type, you also override the equals method to say, when should we consider two objects equal? Um, and, but you can't override in the same way that you could in Simulan, that you can in, in any other uh, object-oriented programming languages, because it's not conceptually pure to take, s if something is in the general class, it should stay there. You can't, concepts should be more special, so they shouldn't be able to throw things away from the more general concepts. They should only be able to extend them. So in beta, you can't override. What you do instead is you specialize the method. So we saw how you can inherit from one method to another, and, that, and, and that's what you have to do also when you have a virtual method. The, the override it essentially implicitly inherits from the uh, original declaration. So again, we have something here that doesn't do much. It has a bool, but it doesn't do anything with it. Instead, it has an inner, and people who overwrite the equals method can then provide the body that does the actual comparison and assigns the result into the, the result variable here. Um, another interesting way of using virtual patterns. So we, so now we have virtual patterns, both virtual classes and virtual procedures. But another thing that in Simula, you can only have virtual members in classes. You can't have them in procedures. But in beta, for the, because of the generality, you can have virtual methods inside of other methods. So the, so the find method uh, specializes for each, adds a where virtual method that you use to provide a condition to the find method that you need to satisfy in order to be found by the find method. So that's, an, again, an abstract method that returns a Boolean. And somebody who uses the find method, they start out by creating a sub, uh, a, a sub class, a sub procedure that specializes the where method to do the actual comparison. And then you run it, and, um, and that's what it does as it goes down the chain, as it for each is. Right? So this kind of combines it all together. So just to say, very, very beautiful conceptual generalization probably a little too abstract for most people, um, so it didn't re nothing really came of it. As for the, why is beta syntax so odd, um, Kristen really liked um, hanging out, and uh, when he came to Aarhus, he was off to visit, which he kept doing also when I was a student, and I met him many times. Um, he was often bored, and he wanted to go out and have fun, but you know, um, there was a particular day when all the 
all his own old students were busy with their kids, and the only people who could go out with him was me and one of my fellow students, who was also called Christen. Um, so we went to Cafe Casablanca in Aarhus, and we got drunk, and Christen started explaining why Beta had the syntax it had. Um, essentially, they had had this idea that it's easier to learn a programming language if all the, if all the constructs are described with words. But it gets tedious to use uh, programming language when, you're, when you become proficient and you're a professional developer, so you want to have short little squiggles, like in C. C is very terse, has very few words, keywords. And so they wanted to say, well, they want to give you a choice. Every construct has two syntaxes. It has a word syntax and a glyph syntax. Okay? So that was the idea for beta. And they designed it all out. And that design, he actually wrote down on the paper tablecloth uh, where we were sitting in the bar and, uh, and drinking. And, um, and uh, I later, just uh, almost like the day after, I woke up and I uh, went and talked to my buddy, Christian, and we were like, why did we not keep the, the, the tablecloth? Why didn't we bring it with us after we, when we went home? We were too drunk to think of it. Imagine having that tablecloth today, and it had like all Christian Nigo's scribbles specifically, you know, um, especially for us. That would have been cool, but we didn't do it. Um, anyway, so uh, looking further into the future, of course, um, the next generation of object-oriented programming languages, uh, there was an object Pascal slash Turbo Pascal slash Delphi. Uh, Anders Heilsberg was involved in most of those um, in implementation of them. Um, and um, there was um, Java, of course, which is the big, big thing that came out of uh, some a weird marriage between Smalltalk and C++ that turned out surprisingly well. They, they were really basing Java off of Smalltalk. James Gosling has talked about this since. That it was, they like this very dynamic thing, and Java has reflection and all that. and has a strong runtime representation of objects, of, of classes, which C++ doesn't. It, it raises it all by compile time. But they wanted it to be accessible. They wanted it to be strongly typed, and they wanted it even strong, more strongly typed than C++, which doesn't say a lot. Um, and they wanted it to be accessible to people, so they stole all the C syntax um, and C++ syntax. And that was essentially how Java came about. And of course, it was wildly, wildly successful. Um, and uh, also derived from Smalltalk was a bunch of scripting languages, Python, Ruby, uh, several of them. I just put Python here. Uh, that became very successful. Python is now in the Stack Overflow survey this year. I think it's a, the fourth most popular language um, because of its use in the science community that's now turning into um, data science code all over. Um, a, ver a, a very obscure route uh, where they took s small talk and ripped out the classes and only left objects. So if you wanted to make new objects, you just had to create them from scratch or clone them from other objects. It's called prototype-based programming. And that would have remained obscure if it wasn't for JavaScript um, that uh, became, in the three weeks that it was written, <laughs> uh, it was inspired by all of these, Java from the, for the syntax, and the, it was a scripting language inspired by Python, and it, it had this prototype-based objects idea that um, was built in. So now everybody, the most popular programming language in the world now uses, um, has only recently gotten classes. Classes isn't even, uh, up until now, wasn't even a thing in this supposedly object-oriented programming language. So that was sort of the, and of course the story goes on, but um, the one, only one thing I also want to mention is that yeah, somewhere in there, the C-sharp, which was you know, mildly inspired by Java, um, and to, um, to make a joke of it, and, um, and of course by others as well, including re reinstating some C++ concepts. So that's kind of how it all played out, but there is beta uh, all alone with no arrows going out from it. Nobody really actually ever used it for anything. <laughs> no, no one adopted it industrially for long, and, it, um, and not many of the ideas made it, except for the virtual classes that I mentioned before, made it to other, other languages. So it was kind of like, a, in a sense, it, was a, um, it wasn't the success that Simula was. Uh, it didn't have the impact or the usage, but, um, but from a... And I, uh, an academic point of view, it's a really wonderful thing to study. And it kind of reminds us that, um, you know, sometimes it, uh, it's one of those languages, like self actually also. I love self and, and beta because they're languages that take a concept and they go all the way with it. And it's very, not just mind-blowing, but mind-expanding to sometimes go and learn and maybe use those languages and think about, wow, wow, the world lo really looks different from this place. Um,
kind of like fundamentalism. It makes the world, it makes it a lot easier <laughs> to, to interpret everything in the world. Um, Kristen was uh, very loved and well known in the in the programming community. I, ha I happened to I arranged a programming language conference about five years ago, and uh, we had a we had a party, and some of my speakers were older than the rest, and sort of they. They were catching up from old days. This, this is uh, Bjarne Struhstrup, who was the keynote speaker there. And we have, um, we have um, Dave Unger, who was the, the primary designer of Self that I showed before. Um, we have uh, Will Cook, who has also um, influenced programming languages over the years. And they were kind of sitting for themselves in a four-person booth. And I'm walking around being the organizer, checking in on people. And I'm, there are these three old guys, some creaky knee guys. I'm like, can I get you guys something? Can I fetch a beer for you, whatever? And they're like, hey, Matt. We were just exchanging stories about Kristen Newgore. Do you want to sit down and join us? And they pointed to the fourth empty seat. And I was like, I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. I get to sit and talk to these old guys about Kristen Newgore. They were all just like, they all had different stories. They, they interacted with them in different periods of time. And, um, and we're just all like touched by him. It's kind of impressive that it's not just the technology. It's really also the person really, um, really uh, touched a lot of people there. Um, so um, I'm happy to have known him a little. Um, and had that experience. His final, a lot of people uh, uh, now, uh, if you go and read his, um, the, the eulogies and so on for Kristen, a lot of people re reference his last public uh, talk that I was also at, which was a banquet speech at the ECUB conference in Malaga in, in uh, 2002. Um, as it turned out, only a few months before he died of a heart attack. And a few months before Ole Johan Dahl died, he was actually sick at the time, and we signed a giant big uh, get well card for him. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough. Um, and uh, he gave this fun speech that many people remember, and I particularly, it was like hilarious. He was so, so funny. And, and one of the things that he, um, he took offense to was that Danes have this, we, uh, I just, just to make it clear if it, if it isn't already, we Danes make a lot of fun. Uh, uh, we, we poke a lot of fun at Norwegians. Um, and, uh, you know, we, um, it's all unfounded, but particularly we have this notion, uh, we have this term called fjellever, which is uh, mountain monkeys, right? And um, that's, that just means Norwegians. I'm sorry, but it's slang for Norwegians. And he picked up on this, and he was mildly offended by it, and he said, well, well in Norway, it, it, it wasn't true, but it was fun. Like, in Norway, we call Danes plain monkeys, ambiguity intended. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought that was kind of, that was kind of neat. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that the only thing left uh, is to think about, well, what, what were some of the things that also maybe came in from the beginning with object-oriented programming, but maybe weren't so good? And then we can talk a little bit about the future. Um, so this conceptual model thing as a model, as a reasoning for why the language is designed the way it is, it's all fair and good, but sometimes we have to be honest and say, well, there are a la the languages could have lo looked a lot different and still fit the conceptual framework that they came up with. Right? There were some things in particular that weren't in the language that weren't there because the conceptual, the, the concept said that they should be, but they were there because it was for computers and we couldn't figure out how to do it otherwise. Right? One of them is single inheritance. Right? So uh, concepts can totally overlap. You can have overlapping concepts. Right? Um, you can have... You, you can have um, in Denmark, we have all these Pulsebone, that you, you have a, 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 a mobile sausage stand, right? So it's both a vehicle and it's, uh, and it's uh, an eatery, right? Okay, so it's overlapping concepts. And you have that all over. Um, it's easy to run into that in, in real life. So it's not like neat hierarchies. It's a web, right? There, there's definitely specialization and generalization. It's an ordered graph, but it's not, um, and it's not cyclic, but, it, but it's also not just a hierarchy. It's not, um, um, it's not a tree. So uh, object-oriented programming has struggled with this ever since. Like for these 50 years, there's been this uneasy thing about, should you have multiple inheritance then? C++ has multiple inheritance. Other languages do. But it gets really ugly because translating that into something that's beautiful at a language level and, and efficient and easy to reason about turned out to be surprisingly hard. And so we've landed now and this uneasy compromise in the statically typed languages uh, that we have interfaces, which are not classes, but they're very like classes, but they don't have code in them, and so they don't have the technical problems that you have when you try to combine 
different concepts. So you can have all your concept overlap that you want at the interface level. Once you get to classes, you have to choose what's the main hierarchy and then uh, do that in classes. And it's not beautiful, you know? It's, it's not economical to have these two different kinds of types, um, but it's the way we could figure out how to do it. A bigger one I want to say um, is the, the singularity, the, the null reference exceptions. Um, so I mentioned Tony Hoare invented um, the, reference, the referenced record types and invented the null reference because it was easy. That's like, okay, they can be null because that's their in then we now we have an initial value for them and, um, and everyone's happy and off to the races. And, and he calls it his billion dollar mistake and gives talks about that. Like, and um, we never really came to grips with that. Null, null reference exceptions are not just in optical and programming languages, but they're worse because everything is a reference. Everything's by reference, so you have them all the time. And also, most optical and programming languages are strongly imperative, and so you end. So the way that you, uh, the way that an object starts out, it starts out with its fields having all the default values, and then you have to initialize it before before uh, it should be observed, but people can typically observe objects before they're fully initialized or they forget to initialize something and these default values um, leak out. So there, there's a lot of risk of null. And by the way, null isn't bad, right? Null is a very useful thing for expressing, okay, something, I, I didn't have that, I didn't have that value or it's only sometimes there or whatever. Like it's a very semantically useful thing. And what Tony Hoare said was uh, he should just have introduced a notion in the type system where you could declare whether null was okay or not. Like if you'd done that, said there's, there's nullable and non-nullable references, then you wouldn't have had this problem with null reference exceptions because then the type system could tell you when you were doing the right thing and when you weren't. And we're sort of only slowly coming to grips with that now. Some of the modern programming languages are, are a lot better at dealing with nulls. We're trying to add something to C-sharp. Uh, nullable reference types that let you distinguish between whether, whether object references should be, should be null or not. And if they shouldn't, then we can say, don't stick a null in there and give you a warning. And if they should, then we let you do it. But then when you dereference, we say, hey, you forgot to check for null before you dereference. And we can catch you there and help reduce the null reference exceptions, which are really like a, I think of it a little bit like fossil fuels, fuels right? Um, in that the fossil fuels really help civilize, give civilization a boost and we grew our economy and our science and everything a lot more quickly because of fossil fuels, but we also paid a high price that now we have to learn how to, how to uh, get along without it. And I think uh, null was one of those things that it was one of those shortcuts to greatness that we were sort of all just ignoring the elephant in a room for a while and, and well, we can't keep doing that. So looking for the next 50, uh, 50 years from now, somebody can use the, the, the zeros and the 100 for an OO joke if, if they want to, if they're still object oriented programming around. You know, um, the pennies for, uh, for every object. Um, and um, it might be good to take a temperature on how is object oriented programming doing? Now, obviously, it's wildly successful. You have to go pretty far down the list of most used languages before you get to one that's not object oriented. So obviously, it has succeeded wildly in a certain sense. But it's also the object-oriented paradigm is struggling to deal with some of the modern challenges in programming. Um, in particular, it's sort of very, it's very fine-grained on state, right? It says that um, everything I know about sheep should be in the sheep class. Right? Everything I know about sheep, uh, not just what data is in, to, uh, used to, to track the sheep, uh, but also all the functionality that they have. It will be in virtual methods. And when I want to do something that's particular to every animal, uh, the way I do it is that I put a virtual method in animal and I override it and it's all, to, it's all together, it's all encapsulated together. And that's great if you're only describing, if you're only using sheep for one kind of program, right? And if you're doing it locally and you can track all the state and so on. But both sort of at a program level and also at the program execution level to go to those two levels again, we're now in a much more distributed world. You have libraries of data uh, and you have libraries and you have actual data that gets used um, from many different programs and also on many different computers at the same time. Like the, the shapes get used in many different programs and the data get used on many different machines. So there's all this distribution that kind of 
tears against the encapsulation of object-oriented programming. And so I think that, I think functional programming has answers to all of that, but they, but they suck in other ways. Like they, they lack a lot of the goodness of object-oriented programming. And I think that um, the, the trend that we've been seeing now uh, for the last, it's, it started about a decade ago, I think with, with the programming language Scala, is to try to bring object-oriented and functional programming together and try to look for, instead of viewing them as we did in the old days, certainly as, uh, as Kristen's age did, as being like fundamentally different and completely separate paradigms, we should try to look for commonalities and in which ways are object-oriented and functional programming actually the same or very compatible and try to bring them together into a unified uh, paradigm that sometimes has two different ways of doing things, but they're complementary rather than competing, right? I think uh, Scala did a good first whack at that. It was the first language that had that as a philosophy from the start, saying uh, we want to create a language that is equally an object and a functional uh, programming language, but not in that it just smooshes all the features from both in, but it tries to think them together, tries to unify them. Like beta tried to unify classes and, and procedures, they try to unify the two uh, paradigms. And I think that's a good, I, I don't agree with everything they do in Scala by far in, in the specifics, but I think that's a great philosophy. And, I, and having started out in C Sharp with an object-oriented programming language, um, people sometimes accuse me of, um, you know, uh, they don't quite dare to do that, but they sometimes sort of imply that we're like blinded by functional programming and we don't like object-oriented programming anymore. But we're really trying to import good ideas from functional programming into C Sharp in a way that complements and works well with what's already there and creates sort of like this combined world where you can use the right tools for the job um, in, in, on both sides. So that's sort of like, that's I think a trend that we'll see play out over the next decade and, um, and have languages that are a lot less pure one or pure the other. Of course, maybe some new ideas may come out or new turns may happen in the world that obviate all that and something new will happen. I can't look 50 years out in the future. But that's the, that's the change that I th I'm seeing now that's been ongoing for a while and I think it's going to hit the mainstream um, over, the, over the next decade or so. It's going to become mainstream um, as the, the current big languages try to ad adapt to this. And it may be that we get replaced by some that do it better because they do it from the beginning. Maybe that dispels the death of C Sharp and Java and all that, but we try not to. We try to, we try to be part of that movement and, um, and do a good job of embracing it. So that puts us at the end of the talk. Um, yeah, I'll take questions and hang out for a bit if you want. Right, well, options sort of solve the problem if you, if that's all you have from the start, then it becomes a lot better. Um, they solve part of the problem then in that you don't have any other mechanisms. You, in, the problem is that in our current languages, we already have decoupled the checking of null from the dereferencing, right? So you can forget to do one and still do the other. If you, if you start with option types, uh, the way you get at the, what's inside is some sort of pattern matching where you can't get the value inside without also checking for null at the same time. So it's sort of like, by construction, impossible to get a null reference exception. However, what you're not solving is, what's, for when you don't have an option type, when you have something that's just a reference and you know it never to be null, you want it to never be null, what's its default value? Yes, and ha that you have to assign it. That is very hard to enforce. It's barely possible to enforce in a functional world where you don't typically have subtyping and overriding and, and chaining constructors and all that. In an object-oriented world, getting all that toothpaste back in the tube and making sure that nobody ever forgets to assign to a non-nullable thing, um, that is, in practice, extremely hard to do. Right? It may be that we make language assigned progress enough, I, I'd, I'd love for that to be the case, that we actually can get there and say, okay, uh, we've got this solved now. This was, that turned out to be the way to do it. But we're not quite there yet. It's, it does it from scratch. But Swift has problems where you 
you get into the corners and you still struggle with the default value stuff. It's, they pushed it pretty far to the corners and it's pretty impressive what they did. And they could do that because they start out fresh with a new language. Um, but they, they still have problems. Um, to the extent that they're object oriented, it's very, it's extremely hard. And you know, languages are messy. We have, um, we also have static constructors, and we have, and when you have, const and in constructors, you can call virtual methods on the object that you're in, and that even though it's not initialized, and there are all this stuff that's just ch chasing down all that to make sure that you never ever observe a non-nullable reference before it's been assigned is. Well, in our current languages, it's impossible. It's just, uh, it's just uh, too incomplete, right? It can't be done um, but, um, in the general. But we may be able to have languages where we can button it down enough without lobotomizing it to the point where it's not usable anymore. Finding that balance, I think it's an open question still. And we, we're making, but we're making, all trying to make strides at it from different angles. And that's why I think it's totally conceivable that we'll find the right balance and that New programming languages five years from now will no longer have this problem. That would be awesome. Of course, we, we still will. <laughs> we can't, can't get rid of it in C Sharp, for instance. Do you think uh, functional programming languages solve that problem? Um, well, they do it better. Yeah. But that's because, there's exp that's because of the aspect of being a functional programming language that is that there are a lot of things you can't do in them. <laughs> yeah, they button you down quite hard, right? In some functional programming languages, you can't even reassign things. Right. Uh, they, they, uh, all things are immutable. They, t they trend heavily towards immutable. Um, and there are just some kinds of abstraction that are not there. So it kind of, yes, you can most of the time if you don't want all these other good features. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. And some people are happy just living in a functional world. Well, more power to them. They don't have the null problem. And they can be very <laughs> arrogant about it. <laughs> like, oh. We don't have that problem over here anymore. Yeah, you guys, you, you know. But, um, but the truth of the matter is that they, that's a lot of uh, expressiveness that they leave on the table like that. So, yeah. If we can solve it in that hybrid world where functional and object oriented are, are coming together, that would be, be fabulous. I would love a future that, that has that. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, I think functional programming is more uh, worried about what you want to do, like just, just do that. Uh, and imperative is more like how you should do it. Yeah. So those two questions have to kind of be answered in some way together. Mm -hmm. And that is very tricky. The how and the why. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. Um, or the how and the what, maybe, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah. You kind of have to again. You have to strike the balance. Nobody is particularly in love with having to say how all the time, right? Um, and that's part of why people love functional programming is you can. But you often end up saying the how anyway. You just say it differently. Uh, that's still nitty gritty. You never get away from the nitty gritty. Um, uh, but um, yeah, we'll see where it goes. But I, I think um, I'm optimistic about. I, I really like. I like the programming language scene right now. I like that we are not monopolies with the big languages, but that there are lots of smaller, very forward-looking, creative uh, languages that are actually thriving industrially as well. I think it pushes us all. It pushes up the velocity of innovation in programming languages in a good, good way. Um, so, yeah, I'm really happy about that. It's, um, that's the right way. It was a bit boring for some years there where Java was kind of sitting on everything. I went to, um, I was a researcher at the time, I went to research conferences and all the research papers was, uh, essentially the title of all the papers was doing what we did the last time we published a paper but now in Java, right? Yeah. It's all reheated stuff, trying to, everyone tried to get on the Java bandwagon. It was amazing how much air it took out of the room. That was not a good environment. It, I mean, Java is good in many ways, but there was just not a good environment where nothing else could, could thrive. Um, so it's much better now. There, I, I don't mind the competition. I welcome it. It's like we're, we're all in this, in this quest together to make programming better. So, Cool. Thanks for coming, y'all. <laughs> um, yeah, it was not as big as the first one, uh, but it was 
it was, it was fun. It was more fun in a different way this, this way. Thanks for sticking with me. Thank you.